All right, why don't we get started? It's 4.03, there's usually some laggers that, uh, uh, that takes about five minutes, but I'll just start real slow. Uh, today's topic is annular tears, that's in the disc by the way, and nagging low back pain. Um, and we wanna mainly talk about the patient's perspective. So what I'd like to do today is um, give a short presentation on the problem and, and kind of put it into context. And then we have two guests. We have uh, two of my patients that had laser endoscopic spine surgery for a herniated disc and for a uh, annular tear. And we can ask them questions about what you know, their situation was like, why they had surgery, what surgery was like. So let me share my screen with you to introduce our two guests. And um, I just think it's so awesome that they took time off their busy day to join us because I've already treated them and they're already better. So they don't really need me anymore. So they're doing, they're doing this as a favor to me and to everyone that has this problem and wants to learn more about it. So thank you very much. The first person is Tim Lawrence. Um, he's the CEO of LHPH Capital, um, but he's just a normal, handsome man that has a family, wants to take care of um, uh, his family, wants to work, wants to you know, pursue his hobbies and enjoy life. But he's had back pain due to this annular tear. Um, and after much ado, we ended up having surgery. We did laser endoscopic surgery. So um, after my talk, we'll hear a short testimonial from him and then we can pepper him with questions of all kinds. Uh, and then we also have Dr. Damon Smith. He's a radiation, radiation oncologist, but to us, he's just another handsome white guy. Uh, he's going to try not to be a doctor as much as a patient. Um, and we can ask him all kinds of questions about what his symptoms are like. He had a herniated disc and sciatica, um, and he under, um, ended up having laser endoscopic surgery. So we can talk to him about what made him decide to have surgery, how he chose laser surgery instead of traditional surgery, and any other questions that you want, might have. Uh, so please use the chat feature. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little strip, a black strip that has mute, stop video, participants, etc. where it says chat. If you click on that, you can chat with us. Just make sure it's going to everybody uh, and ask your questions. We'll all be looking at that, whoever's not talking. Um, that excludes me. Um, and we'll start generating a list of questions. If it's an awesome question, we'll even interrupt somebody and, and stop. Uh, but we want to make this mostly Q&A. So with that, um, let me give my presentation and then we can uh, watch the testimonials and then open it up to a Q&A free for all. All right, so. Are you on the present? Can you see the presentation view now? Okay, so let me start out by introducing myself. I think most people know who I am. I'm the spine surgeon. I'm in San Diego, and I specialize in mental invasive surgery. And mental invasive surgery is not just one surgery. It's multiple different types of surgeries, but it basically is a concept of how we kind of attack any problem anatomically. And there's one specific surgery that I just absolutely love. It's the laser endoscopic discectomy. Uh, and there's two parts of that description that are really important. The first is the use of the laser, that's relatively new, and the use of the endoscope, which is also new for spine. It's not new for shoulders, hips, knees, um, uh, gallbladders, etc. We use the endoscope um, in many different areas, but in this, the world of spine, we're kind of a little bit slower because I don't know why, because we're spine surgeons, I guess. But that has been a really important component of you know, taking our ability to treat patients mental invasively to the next level. Um, and whenever I use the word laser or endoscope, people start to get a little kind of suspicious that it's something totally kind of gimmicky or new, but it's been around for a long time. And um, I've been doing the surgery for a long time. I probably have done almost a thousand cases. So I have a very good idea of what works and what doesn't work. And I think this is a good opportunity to you know, talk to patients about what the, what their kind of experiences like. But what, okay. Sorry. All right, so let me start off by just kind of explaining to you why we're talking about this. 
Um, and I like the word nagging low back pain because whenever somebody talk, thinks about spine surgery, they picture somebody in a wheelchair getting wheeled into my office and oh my goodness, it's the end of the world. You're in a wheelchair and we have to do surgery now. And that's the only time to do surgery. And in many cases that is true. But if you look at this problem of nagging low back pain, you'll be surprised at how big of a problem this is in terms of society and how much of a gap there is in our ability to treat these, this group of patients. Because at some point, nearly all of us as an adult will have an episode of some significant back pain. Now, luckily, the vast majority of us, 90% of us, that episode of relatively severe back pain will get better on its own over six weeks, not on its own, with non-operative treatment over six weeks. Um, so for most of us, it's a scary event, but you can just move on with life. But there's a small percentage of those patients where that pain does not go away and it becomes chronic. And depending on how severe that chronic pain is and what your kind of demands are for life, like what you do for work, what you want to do for fun and leisure and exercise and health and fitness and, and interacting with other people, depending on how intense that demand is, that chronic pain could be the difference between you being like the best you can be versus kind of like you're just kind of getting by with life. And let's face it, life is short. You only live once, unless you believe in reincarnation, which I kind of do. But as far as we know, we only appreciate one life. You got to live it to its full extent. So if you have a problem that is holding you back, as long as there's a relatively reasonable solution, we should look at that. Um, and I'm here to tell you that there is, even though most people think there isn't. Anyway, this, if you take the number of people in America and you boil it down to you know, a certain percentage becoming chronic, that is a huge number. And it makes sense because if you just ask, what are, what's the main reason people go to a doctor? The first is like a cold. The second is back pain. That's the second most common reason. You can eliminate a huge number of office visits if you didn't have this as a problem. And in terms of work, it is the number one cause of missed work and disability, the number one cause. So think about how big of a problem this is. And I suspect most of us know someone that has this problem or you are <laughs> that person. So where does this pain come from? And this is where things get kind of dicey. So if you're a doctor, this is how we think. These are the causes of back pain. So if you're like um, an ER doctor, and you walk into the ER, they're kind of trained to rule out all the crazy things that are an emergency. So they wanna make sure it's not a cancer or a fracture, a broken bone, some serious illness like ankylosing spondylitis. So you have severe spinal stenosis or you have a big disc herniation and nerve symptoms. You know, those are the kind of big things that we think about that you go see a doctor and they send you a spine surgeon and you may have surgery. But if you look at this circle, this is a pie chart, that kind of straightforward, okay, we should send them to a spine surgeon, you know, it's something that needs spine care. That is this portion of the chart. Everyone else that complains to the primary care doctor, we don't know what to do with them because they have this thing called nonspecific back pain. And look what percentage of everyone that goes to the doctor's office has nonspecific low back pain. It's the big blue part of the pie chart. It's like 80%. So if 100 people go to the doctor with low back pain, 80 of them are told, I don't know what's wrong with you. It's not important. I don't know what to do with you. It's not important. Just go away. We don't have any treatment for you. Maybe some ibuprofen, maybe like some lame PT, but really no like focused effort to try to deal with this problem because you don't have any of these things that doctors think are important. But for this 80% of patients, that's a big deal. And they've been a group of patients that we just didn't know what to do with for a very long time. And it's a frustrating group to treat. Now, the way I think about back pain is much more anatomic. This is a surgeon's view of back pain. Um, and that's important because you, know, you need to think anatomically if you wanna operate on something and in many ways, you need to think anatomically if you have kind of musculoskeletal disorder. So if you look at the anatomic causes of back pain, here are the main causes. The most common is a disc problem, something in the disc. The discs are the shock absorbers in the spine. But 
a very close second and maybe the main cause of why you go to the doctor is the pain due to the muscles. So here's how it all plays out. You have like a subtle disc problem. That disc problem has a pain signal. It sends it up brain and your brain goes, whoops, there's a disc problem. We should try to protect it, lock everything down. And we use the muscles so we can control to try to compensate for this problem. And for the majority of us, we do pretty good with that. And we just go about our day and just do the best we can. But at some point, and for some people, it's not enough. And after a while, the muscles start to get really sore. It would be no different than if I were to just stand there and hold my new iPhone 12 Pro Max. This thing's like a brick. It's so heavy. So when I do like like FaceTime calls, and I have to hold my phone out here like this, my deltoid muscle gets really sore. So it's like anything. If your back muscles are straining to hold you upright or straining to kind of protect a pathologic segment, and it's just on and firing for a long time, it's going to get very, very sore. And at some point, it's going to start causing tendonitis. When you get muscle spasms combined with tendonitis, that's the pain that you get when you have back pain that makes you walk like this, like bent over like this, like I'm fine, but my back is a little bothersome right now because it's basically in a spasm and it will take your breath away. It's actually not usually the disc itself that causes more of a pain like it's a toothache, but that really severe sudden type pain is muscles trying to compensate for that disc problem. And that's why the majority of patients I treat with physical therapy combined with exercise and fitness because you just want to make the muscles stronger so that it can do the job to accommodate these little subtle disc problems and things like that. When the muscles can't do it, it starts to hurt, go into a spasm, cramp up, um, et cetera. Now, if you get to the point where you've treated the muscles and you still have pain due to the disc, that's when you start thinking about doing more than just physical therapy and exercise because ligaments, and even the bones can cause pain. But these are the two main things, disc problems and the associated musculoskeletal pain that comes with it. I'm somewhat oversimplifying it. So when you look at it like this, um, muscles are treated with exercise, physical therapy, rehabilitation, fitness. Disc problems generally need either surgery or just completely modifying your activity so it doesn't stress the disc. Um, but in reality, you're trying to get the muscles to compensate for disc problems and you maximize that. And when that's not enough, then you start thinking about surgery. All right, so non-operative treatment and operative treatment are always kind of like, in my mind, the two big branch points. We always wanna start with non-operative treatment unless you have a problem where like cancer, infection, or a major neurologic deficit that the longer you have a neurologic deficit, the less likely it is that it will get better. Sort of like a spinal cord injury, you know, it doesn't always recover. You can get that in the peripheral nerves, even in your lumbar spine with a really large disc herniation. The worst case would be cauda equina syndrome. But for the vast majority of patients, we have tons of time, except there's pain and suffering. So it is very common that I push non-operative treatment before I even talk about surgery. I would say that for one surgery that I do on a patient, I see 15 other patients in the office and take care of 15 other patients non-operatively. So I'm mostly a non-operative spine physician and occasionally a spine surgeon, uh, even though I just always go on about uh, that I'm a surgeon. And then there's operative treatment. So if we do surgery, there's multiple different kinds of surgeries, um, but if you're busy, you're working, you're a key breadwinner for the family, and you have a career that you don't want to stall right now because you're, you know, you're trying to do better and better at work, for example. Um, and your pain has been around for more than a year. And you've done everything to try to get this better, like modified your workstation, because sitting for a long time slouch like this is really bad for your back, but I think everyone knows that. You already like avoid painful activities. And if it involves things that you enjoy doing, like for example, I like playing golf, I like kickboxing. Um, um, and if I had a back problem that prevent me from doing those things 
in addition from preventing me from work, I'd be freaking out right now. A lot of us basically get to the point where you haven't, you've done enough to barely get through work, but you can't do anything else. And that's where like the value proposition lies. You may be okay with it. I personally would be freaking out that I can't do these other things to the best of my abilities. Um, and if you're that person, then you're starting to think about surgery. And of course, you've tried things like physical therapy, chiropractic care, acupuncture, medications, etc. Um, and now you're faced with one of two choices. You could have, you can either live with it like this, or you can have surgery. And if you have an annular tear with back pain, the most common surgery for that is a fusion surgery. So I have a sea of patients. So you know that hundred, that pie chart of hundred patients. Imagine it's 100 million patients and 80% of them have this non-specific low back pain. That is a huge number. And a bunch of those patients have exactly this problem. They need a fusion, but they're not bad enough because they're right in the middle of their career. So what do they do? They suffer, everyone else around them suffers and they just deal with it because their pain is not bad enough to have a fusion, but it's bad enough to kind of mess up their quality of life. It's a quality question. So until recently, we were stuck. Now, here's a very typical patient like one of our patients that are joining us, Mr. Lawrence, has an annular tear. And if you look at this, it doesn't look that bad. And if you look at the person, they don't look that bad, but they're cranky when they get home. They don't enjoy or look forward to doing leisure activities that involve anything that involves standing for a long time, bending, twisting, or turning. And let's face it, fun things involve bending, twisting, and turning. Otherwise, life would be boring. Um, and you cannot pursue those. You're, you're just not enjoying life. And you're just kind of a bit of a crankpot or an Eeyore. And basically, this is what an annual tear looks like. It is a tear in the back part of the, the outer part of the disc that holds in the central gel called the nucleus. The gel is what acts like a shock absorber and the annulus that surrounds the nucleus is a, a network of dense crisscrossing collagen fibers that holds everything in. Otherwise, it would squirt out like a, like a jelly donut. Over time though, the outer part of that disc can start to fray and fissure and tear and then the gel can start leaking in through the cracks and that's what a what an annular tear looks like on MRI, that's, that's happened. We call that HIZ, but basically during surgery, it is filled with this gelatinous uh, nucleus material that's trapped inside here. And when it goes in there, it activates all the little nerve endings on the outside of the disc that tells the brain that something's wrong. And if any of this leaks out, which it often does, the body's immune system thinks it's a foreign body and attacks it to try to reabsorb it. And whenever the body's healing response gets activated, it always activates the inflammatory system. So now you have a healing response, you have a trap fragment, and it just keeps happening over and over and over again. It doesn't just get fixed and then turn off. It just stays on in this repetitive chronic pattern of inflammation, and guess what happens? You develop more and more pain and it lasts for a long time. Anyone that's had this problem in their elbow, like tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, plantar fasciitis, IT band syndrome, greater trochanteric tendonitis, rotator cuff syndrome, they all know how painful a chronic inflammatory condition is. It, it's really intense when it comes on and it usually lasts for like months because you can't easily turn it off. So this is pretty, it's like one of those subtle nagging problems that just tortures you, uh, but it's not life or limb threatening, it's just quality of life threatening. And what is it basically? It's in a, in a simplified diagram, it's basically this nucleus gel making its way through tears in this blue, like dense collagen fiber and getting trapped in there. And when that happens, the body responds by releasing all these kind of inflammatory mediators and turning on all these um, uh, like monitoring nerve fibers. They're almost kind of a surveillance system for the spine. And that's what causes the pain. And we see this all the time. And one of the confusing things is that if you take 100 people just off the street, don't ask them anything, offer them an MRI, half of them will have an annular tear. And most of those half 
won't even know it because they don't have pain. So here's the conundrum. Not all annular tears cause pain. In fact, most annular tears are asymptomatic and they are seen as like an incidental finding. They're part of the general process. But that's not the same as saying annular tears are never painful because in that small proportion of patients where the annular tear is painful, for them, it's 100%. And that pain could be very severe. So we have this conundrum where we've been trained as physicians. Annular tears are just incidental findings. You don't need to operate on them um, unless they cause symptoms, but they never cause symptoms. And now, after a while, we just stop looking at them because, in part, we don't have a treatment for this other than a fusion surgery, and we don't like doing fusions anymore. Uh, and a surgery like a microdiscectomy, we consider too big of a surgery for this problem because it may generate a bigger lesion than what we started with. So what's the solution to this conundrum? This has been around for a long time, but we've just kind of re rediscovered this kind of application where, okay, you've got this little lesion causing big symptoms. We don't want to do a big surgery because the surgery may be worse than the underlying lesion to begin with. Is there a really small minimal invasive surgery where we can target that annular tear, get in, get out with minimum uh, collateral damage, and will it be effective in decreasing the patient's pain? And I would say that that um, is the laser endoscopic surgery. That is one of my favorite applications for that surgery now. The, the best application is a herniated disc surgery for sciatica, but there's already good treatment for that. Uh, that's called the standard microdiscectomy. But for the annular tear, discogenic low back pain, the laser endoscopic strategy is the standout. And uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, there'll be more surgeons kind of appreciating this so that this kind of treatment will be available to more people. And essentially what you do is you first confirm that that annular tear is causing pain. And the way we do that is uh, it's simple. We do a targeted epidural steroid injection where we bring in a needle in this direction of this arrow and we inject right around here an anesthetic like you get at the dentist office right before they drill a cavity. And you're like, wow, that is making a lot of noise, but doesn't hurt. That's the idea. If you do a targeted anesthetic injection at this annular tear in a patient that has severe low back pain, and they say for like three or four hours after the injection, oh my goodness, no, I don't have any pain. I conclude that annular tear is the cause of the back pain. And if we're lucky, the steroid kicks in and, and it lasts for a long time. And that's the treatment. Um, but many times the anesthetic wears off, the steroid's not enough to kind of deal with this problem, and the pain comes right back. That is a diagnostic injection. And that's when I say, if your pain's bad enough, I have a great operation. It's a poke hole. You go home the same day, I put a little Band-Aid. We use the endoscope. We do the surgery underwater. And I use all kinds of fancy tools, including the YAG Holmium laser to magically vaporize, shrink, ablate, remove, coagulate, all these abnormal pathologic tissues. And you end up with literally candy like this that you get at the store. And when I did open surgery, I never got texts like this, like this the very next day, or it's like three days later, and I already flew home, and oh my God, I'm so much better. If I did an open surgery, it'd be like, Ugh, oh, I'm in so much pain, but thank you, Dr. Kim, you're the best. Okay, bye. Totally different scenario because traditional open surgery, even the good ones have a lot more pain than a little poke hole surgery that we do underwater. So um, the laser endoscopic surgery is like, it's like a 60 degree wedge. You can't use it on everything, but there are times where you really need it because that's the only club that you have to make a flop shot so you can uh, not get it in the water. And that's the kind of the way I think about it. I, I want a full golf bag of all my clubs so that I can deal with all kinds of problems. Uh, and the laser, the laser part of the endoscopic surgery is a key component of that. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. My short, like five, 10 minute presentation was way longer. I apologize. <laughs> I do this all the time, but um, one of these days I have to take a time management course. I just have to find the time. Okay. So with that, I want to introduce you to two people whom I love and adore. <laughs> I seen them naked and rendered them unconscious and assaulted them with a sharp weapon. So we're very close. Uh, the first person is Tim Lawrence. And the second person is Damon Smith, who happens to be a doctor too. 
I operate on a lot of physicians, by the way. Um, that says something too. And I want to start out by showing a testimonial. It's only one minute each, and then we're going to open up to Q&A. So bear with me. I think it's this one. So I'm sitting in the intra-op or the pre-op room right before going in. I had really good sleep. Um, I wasn't super nervous. I woke up a few times, but was able to go back to sleep fine. I've been counting down the days and the nurses here have been awesome. And Dr. Kim just FaceTimed my wife, which was super cool. So everything He's is looking good. He's been freaking out all morning. Don't believe him. No, I'm kidding. He is unbelievably calm and he should be because we're going to take really good care of him. It's going to be awesome. Looking forward to it. Okay, so this is day five post-op, and I'm back at work. Um, I came back yesterday for about five hours and did pretty well, but just wanted to take it easy just in case. Um, but back at work fine. Uh, no issues so far. Pain level today is maybe two, two to three just on Tylenol. So all in all, recovering pretty well. Awesome. Okay, one more video. I just don't know what to do to escape here. Bear with me. This is Dr. Smith's. stop sharing and let's ask some questions. Can I stop share? Okay, I have a question. Um, so I'm going to take everyone else off mute. Thank you. I have a question for Tim. Um, how far out from surgery are you? And Dr. Smith, can you unmute yourself? How far out from surgery are you and how are you feeling now? And um, have you had to change your life in any way to kind of accommodate the post-surgical lifestyle in any way? Give us a sense of, a sense of where you're at. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pretty recent off of surgery. I, mine was October 2nd, so I'm about 10 weeks out. And um, maybe like five weeks into physical therapy. 
And the, gosh, the change has been so dramatic from what it was. I mean, I had two years of locked up back pain. And so I was really stiff. And, um, but in terms of changes since then, um, actually, it's been mostly for the better. I had all these little things that I had to do to get through every day from the way that I put on my clothes in the morning and took showers to the way that I got into my car and sat in my, at my chair at work and all, all those things. So it's like every day I'm pulling away those things more and more, and I'm almost uh, as good as I was before. Okay, so I think Tim has the most common problem. It's mostly back pain, not as much sciatica. Dr. Smith had more sciatica. So um, let me pick on you a little bit, Tim. Uh, so give, yeah. like, give, give us an example of what life was like before and like an example of all these little things that you had to do getting in out of the car and what you had to do at work um, to accommodate to this pain. Yeah. So, uh, but before, before my injury, I was really active. I surfed, I have young kids. I played with my kids a lot, exercised almost every day um, and was just active around the house with building projects and uh, all those things that my wife loves me to do. And um, then it, it, I moved a bunch of furniture and that was the, the beginning of the pain. Um, and I didn't quite know what it was as it was first diagnosed as a lumbar sprain. And Very common. so, and then I just kept having re injuries from moving something not so heavy or leaning this way or that way. And it would like lay me out for, uh, a couple days two or three days, but the pain was always just there and constant, even though it came up and down. Um, so over time, every time that I re-injured myself a certain way, it was like a mental note of, okay, I can't do it that way. I have to compensate and do it this way. So if I hurt myself putting on my socks, then I had a whole new strategy for putting on my socks so that it didn't happen again. And, um, it was the same thing for like getting in my car. I hurt, hurt my back getting in my car one day. And so then I came up with this silly strategy to like get down and hang on to the top and like slither in safely. Um, and it's, I mean, it's just these silly things that I had to do just to get and not re-injure myself. Um, so it was a collection of those really. That is, I'd like to hear from the, the attendees if that is a similar kind of clinical picture that you have, but that is such a common story that I hear. Um, um, and the vast majority of time, the story is very similar in terms of treatment too. Um, kind of modify your activities, keep doing your sock thing and keep avoiding getting in and out of your car that way and do it like this. Because if that's working, that's okay. But once you start getting to the point where you say things like, I stopped playing golf, I stopped kickboxing, I leave work early a lot, and my career stalled because you know, after work, all the people are going out to happy hour and bonding and you know, they're all close. And I just go home because I want to lay down. That I think in my mind is a threshold where you, I would say, okay, I got it. I'm willing to do surgery. What was your threshold to pull the trigger for surgery? Um, it, I probably would have pulled the trigger earlier if I was if I was allowed to, but I think it, it was moving through all the potential non-operative treatments. Um, but for me, I was trimming my beard in the bathroom, and I leaned over the sink, and that was it. And my back went out, and I. I barely made it back into my bed and um, I mean, with like tears in my eyes, I was texting or uh, emailing his office saying, I can't do this anymore because um, I'd done the injections, which were helpful for a period of time. And I just, it was too much. It was emotionally too much, physically too much, my family too much. Um, I just couldn't take it anymore. But you were still working, though, right? Yeah, you're still I was just kind of still... doing your daily. You were able to go to work. You're able to do a little bit of exercise, and like if somebody was just see you on the street, they would think you're fine, right? 
they would think I was fine. They might think I was walking a little funny, as my office colleagues would tell me. Okay. Um, but that, that's about it. What about you, Dr. Smith? What, what was the trigger that just made you decide, okay, I'm done with non-operative treatment. I think I should have surgery. Well, I was going to have to take time off work. And, you know, as I mentioned in that video. Uh, you couldn't even work. Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, I just, I was just going to have to either cut back my hours or, uh, you know, I, I couldn't tell how much time I was going to need to take off. And that was the worst part about it. It wasn't like something where you have a, you know, broken arm or something. You say, oh, well, I got to take two weeks off work. I mean, I didn't know. Was it going to be a right. week? Was it going to be a month? Uh, you know? Uh, because the, the problem was I wasn't comfortable in any position. So, uh, it was just, it was discomfort all the time, but then working was, was just becoming exhausting and, and I was going to have to, to take some time off. Okay. And then we talked about, um, you had a pretty good option of traditional surgery uh, via micro Not, you didn't have to have a fusion when we talked. So how did you decide between a micro which is a the kind of like the gold standard for herniated disc, great operation, one inch incision, you go on the same day, versus the less procedure, which is, in my mind, obviously, even it's like the next iteration of improvement. But um, the microdiscectomy is such a good operation; it's covered by insurance. So, how was it that you decided? What like, what was the turning? Uh, what was the differentiation between? I watched the a video uh, of the microdiscectomy. And, you know, when I saw how you had incised through the posterior capsule of the, of the spinal ligaments and, and you had to drill through the lamina, you had to drill through bone and permanently, permanently remove bone, uh, you know, that's just something I, I didn't, didn't want. Um, you know, and I've seen a lot of patients over the years, I've seen people uh, have back surgery over, you know, my entire 30 year career. And, uh, you know, it used to be everybody was worse off and it wasn't until about 15 years ago that people were, were actually, uh, I hate it when you guys say that. <laughs> uh, it's but, so uh, not fair, but yeah, I know. But, but, you know, I mean, I was told that I was going to have to limit my activities after micro discectomy, number one, uh, which I really didn't want to do. And number two, um, it, it only would have addressed one level. And as you know, I had two levels. I had two bad discs. So All right. So it. that's important. Right. So now a two level microdiscectomy versus a two level less, the incremental advantage is even higher as you go multi-level because a two level micro disc is not like the slam dunk operation as a single level micro disc. So what Dr. Damon, so what we're talking about right now is two disc problems that are very common that have two very different treatments. Uh, Dr. Smith had a herniated disc and sciatica, not much back pain, some back pain, but mostly nerve symptoms going down the leg. And that, that problem is well treated with a surgery that everybody knows how to do called a microdiscectomy. It's a great operation. But I would say that most patients need to take at least around two to four weeks off work because even though the incision is small, it is removing bone. It's actually making an incision, detaching the tendon. Um, there's bleeding, um, so you have to kind of manage the wound and there's a little bit more postoperative pain. When we do the endoscopic discectomy, you usually can get back to work in a few days. And then in terms of kind of high level function, a micro disc, I usually tell people, like if you're a professional athlete, I'd want you to wait three to six months before you start doing sports. But with endoscopic surgery, you can start in six weeks. So for a professional athlete, the difference between six weeks and three, mo and three months could be practically a season. So it's a big deal for them. Um, by the same token, if you have to miss two weeks of work versus a day or two, depending on your job, like me as a spine surgeon, if I miss two weeks of work, I pretty much would not make any income because I'm like a manual laborer. All my income is through surgery and through seeing patients. And I have to be at work to um, uh, for my job. Some people don't have to do that, but you know, two weeks off work for me, I can do the math. I'd be like, okay, I'm going to definitely do the less procedure because of just from a purely financial perspective. Tim has a different situation. Tim has mostly back pain due to an annular tear, not much sciatica. So no one's going to recommend he does a microdiscectomy because the microdiscectomy surgery is designed for herniated discs, not annular tears. So I don't know if that makes sense, but the thinking is the microdiscectomy surgery is bigger than the annular tear. So why would we do a microdiscectomy surgery? make a bigger lesion. That's not perfect logic, but 
most surgeons, including me, when we look at an annular tear, uh, to treat it with a microdiscectomy just seems like it's not going to work. Um, so the one that does work is the fusion surgery, because when you have an annular tear, it's like an arthritis problem, not a pinched nerve problem. And so you want to treat the arthritis in a way. That's the way we think. In spine surgeons, we take a long time to change our way of thinking because we've been drilled into our brains when we're exhausted, all this information. And after a while, we're just like a robot. We're like, you know, speak English. We just, that's the way we've always done it. Um, I don't know if radiation oncology is like that, but spine surgeons in general, once they become a surgeon, it is so hard to change their opinions about anything. Um, I guess in some ways you have to be like that to be a good surgeon, but that's the problem. Um, so you were told you need a fusion, right, Tim? So Tim was told the words that everybody hates, the F word. He said, when you're bad enough, come back and we'll do a fusion. That F word freaks people out. And I have a lot of patients that show up and they'll go, I'll do whatever you want except a fusion, even though they need a fusion. I'm like, but you need a fusion. They just won't do it because it's such a bad connotation. Having said that, my mom had a two-level fusion. She's 84 and she's like a new woman. But here's the problem with fusion surgery. If something doesn't go right, it's not like, it's like a little oops. It's like a big oops. It's like crashing on a double black diamond instead of a blue run. You're going to get a lot more hurt. And so the stakes are much higher. And, and I can do 100 surgeries perfectly, but the human body is such that not all 100 are gonna do well. Somebody's gonna, for one reason or another, not do well for one reason or another, you know, it's, we call it a complication, um, but it doesn't matter if it's a complication or for some reason the patient's not doing well. If they're not doing well, they're not doing well. And if it's because of a fusion surgery, that could be a big problem and this fix could be even bigger. So I know very few spine surgeons who, and I know a lot of spine surgeons, who've had fusion surgeries on themselves or on their family members because we all know what a big deal it is. Um, and I think our patients do too, but we don't necessarily kind of like look, sit in our patient's shoes and go, wow, I've got a really bad annular tear. It's causing a lot of pain. It's not bad enough for a fusion surgery, but I'm still miserable. And you're telling me I need a fusion. I'm so confused. That's a problem. So I think the laser surgery fits that gap the best. Um, and for the microdiscectomy, it's just kind of, I see it as a incremental improvement in our kind of ability to take care of patients. Because in my mind, it, I tell this to my staff all the time. If, if I was a professional sprinter and I ran the 100 yard dash last week in 10.8 seconds and I have another race next week, guess how fast I'm gonna wanna race it? A little bit faster. If I ran it in 10.8 seconds again or slower, I'd be kind of not happy with myself. So in my mind, this is just one, you know, kind of inevitable incremental improvement to the way we take care of patients. Um, and I'm pretty high on it. Um, we should probably talk about some of the negatives, but uh, can somebody pull up the chat box and help me with a question? Because I see a bunch of them oh, and I've been talking so long, I haven't been able to read it. Do you have one? Yeah. Will this procedure be applied to patients with diagnosed spinal stenosis? Okay. So that's a good. So what are things that are not good for the laser? So what's not good for the laser are things that require um, a bigger kind of event. Like let's say you had something called the spondylolisthesis, where one bone is slipped forward on the other. And every time you stand up, it slides forward. And every time you lay down, it slides back. And it's unstable. It's sliding back and forth. We call that um, uh, translational instability. And it's just grinding back and forth. If you go in there with the laser and just treat the disc, but it keeps grinding back and forth, guess what's gonna happen to the disc? It's gonna keep on grinding down. It's gonna keep on being painful. So the laser endoscopic surgery is not very good for things that require stabilization or things that require taking something that's like this and making it like that. For example, in patients with degenerative scoliosis or kyphosis, where we need to straighten their bones out. The laser won't do that. The laser is just to treat little annular tears, herniated discs. Now, if you have something called spinal stenosis without spondylolisthesis, without instability, without deformity, you just need to make room for the nerves. Yes, the laser endoscopic surgery 
may be good for that, but in many patients, it's not enough. So it's like anything. I have a toolbox with multiple tools um, and I'm not like a, like, a, like a handyman that shows up with my favorite screwdriver, the Phillips head screwdriver and go, I have my favorite screwdriver. I fix everything with a Phillips head screwdriver. I don't need anything else. That would make no sense. You need a flathead screwdriver. You need some wrenches. You need some pliers. You need all the different tools that you need to take care of different problems. So the laser endoscopic surgery is one of many tools to treat certain conditions um, because it's better at certain conditions than others. So stenosis is in the, in, in the middle of the road. If you have one or two level stenosis on one side, I love using the laser endoscope. If you have bony stenosis, um, some deformity at multiple levels, it's better to do minimally invasive mini open surgery. And that's usually a minimal invasive hemilaminectomy. Instead of a full laminectomy, you just do half the laminectomy, but reach all the way across to the other side. So you know, everything that we do is always trying to minimize the collateral damage, but still accomplish the same goals of the surgery. Okay, people are asking about chiropractic care and acupuncture. Did you guys do that? Yeah, sure. Surgery? Sure. Damon, do you believe in chiropractors and acupunctures? I do, so, but obviously you do too. Yeah, I mean, I was helped, um, you know, but they can do only do so much. I mean, there's, you know, like, like you say, you, you have multiple tools and, and I think chiropractic is one of the tools, acupuncture is one of the tools and, and those tools worked well for a while, but uh, just got to the point where those were, were inadequate tools. How about you, Tim? Yeah, I was actually seeing a chiropractor at the time uh, maybe for about a year before the injury happened. And so I saw him maybe two days after I started to really have a bad, bad flare up. And, uh, he, he was helpful in managing the pain, but it, it, I saw him for a few months and it was not getting better. He was, he thought, gosh, this is just a weird lumbar sprain. I don't know what to, what else, what else to do. And without having an MRI image or anything like that, he, he was sort of at a loss after working with PT and doing cupping and massage therapy and all these things that we were trying together with good intentions. It just wasn't making a difference. Which brings up one other point that is kind of screwy in the way we deliver medicine. So I don't think this is as big of a problem as it used to be, but like you could not get an MRI until you did six weeks of physical therapy. And I think a lot of insurances still do that, which makes no sense because it makes more sense to get a rock solid diagnosis and then start directed treatment for that diagnosis than to start treatment. And then when it fails, then go back and try to get the diagnosis. I can see both ways, but um, you know, in my way of thinking, I am rapidly trying to find a diagnosis as quickly as possible because that allows me to direct the treatment. And then as I do each treatment, I try to get diagnostic information. So, um, Anything that provides diagnostic remission, including MRIs, I like to get early on. And then um, I've noticed that chiropractors, uh, acupuncturists, uh, and physical therapists are the mainstay of my kind of non-operative treatment support group. Without them, I can't really do non-operative treatment. And I rely on them significantly. Probably the most is physical therapy and chiropractic care. Um, but acupuncture is really good in people that uh, need a little bit of extra help and even post-op patients benefit from chiropractic care and acupuncture. And everybody benefits from physical therapy pre and post-op because as you know, I'm a huge, huge believer in exercise and fitness and huge believer in, in the kind of thinking that we evolved over like 150,000 years like we lived 10,000 years ago. Every day we woke up and we went out to look for food and we tried to avoid getting killed or attacked. And we were like marathon runners. We didn't have Saturdays, Sundays, holidays. Every day was an exercise day compared to today where every day is like living on a flat world with very little exertion day. So um, if, if there's one thing that I would like to, you know, everyone to kind of take home today is that no matter what, whether you have surgery or not, 
it's really important to get really healthy and fit physically um, and stay that way on an ongoing basis. That will probably make it so that you don't even need surgery. And if you do need surgery, it'll make the surgery much easier to recover from and make the surgery kind of durable and last forever. Because most people only want one surgery and never have to look back. All right, anybody, do you guys have any questions that you saw or that you want to get asked? Oh, here's a good question. Okay, what is the incidence of post-op leg pain radiculopathy after your surgery? Also, what, what is the complication profile of surgery? So for the less procedure, I would say that the, um, one, of the, one of the big reasons why other doctors do not do laser endoscopic surgery is that it is really technically difficult to learn. And when I first started learning it, I had a fair number of patients that woke up with worse leg pain than when they started because the way the surgery is done, we're literally working right next to the nerve. We're not removing a bunch of bone to get out of the nerves way. We're just kind of like working in this tight compartment, uh, you know, nudging things over. And when we're first learning, we nudge that nerve over way too aggressively. But as we got better and the technology got better, uh, we were able to be much more gentle with the nerves. So I would say that for people learning how to do the laser procedure, they're post-operative radiculitis rate is probably 10 to 15%. And you can imagine, you do a few of those, you're like, I'm not doing that surgery ever again. Now for me, the rate is around 5% if it's mild and temporary, and a little bit less than 1% if it's kind of significant and lasts more than six weeks. I don't think I've ever had anything last more than six months, um, but that is probably the biggest worry about laser endoscopic surgery. It's, it's post-operative nerve irritation, which is almost always temporary, but it can be very discomforting. And, and let's face it, you're gonna worry until it goes away that it's never gonna go away. The second uh, problem with laser endoscopic surgery is that the cannula is tiny. This is the microdiscectomy cannula. It's small, a one inch incision. But if you compare it with this, it's like, this looks massive. This looks like the Grand Canyon. And inherently, this is the other problem. When you have a tiny surgical target site, you have to be absolutely precise as to where you are and where you get to. And there are times where you can't get to every place. And so one of the limitations is the sheer smallness of the size, which is at the same time the advantage. But I would say that um, there's some discrimination, some degree of stenosis. I've never seen an annular tear that I couldn't get with an endoscope, but there's some lesions I look at and I just think, I don't think I can get that all with an endoscope or for some reason or another, I can't get there with an endoscope or it'd be better. So um, I hope that answers the question about the less. Having said that, taking everything as a whole, this had the least number of complications. This is the second least. <laughs> the third least is a one and two level mental invasive ACDF. Those are the three kind of simplest, most straightforward operations, um, but every operation has a risk. There's no perfect operation. And any surgeon that says they never get complications, they either don't pay attention or they've not done enough surgeries. Okay. And there was a question about if you do come across a foot drop after surgery, what is your protocol? The first is um, to try to calm the inflammation that occurs after surgery. We usually do a medrol dose pack. Sometimes we'll do a targeted epidural steroid injection right around the nerve to calm the inflammation. But mostly we just wait because it's, it's kind of like a healing, recovering, uh, irritation time. And I would say usually within a couple of weeks to a month, um, patients can forget about that uh, kind of funny feeling that they woke up with. All right, we have three more minutes. I have questions about post-operative recovery. Oh, here's a good one. Does lasering the annulus result in a likely fusion in five, 10 years, et cetera? Similar result to discectomy. That's another kind of, what are the drawbacks of surgery? So if you go in there and you muck around with the disc, I can't imagine that you're not injuring the disc itself. And every time you injure a disc, you take it closer to the kind of process of degeneration, like where it starts to wear out faster than it normally does. So any injury makes the wearing out process, the degenerative process, go faster. 
We know that if you do a microdiscectomy and you reach in there, that in eight to 10 years, about 15% of patients develop discogenic low back pain. We think it's because you've mucked around with this. With the endoscopic surgery, I don't know what that number is because there's not enough experience with it, but my guess is that it's very low because I've done about a thousand, probably a few hundred annular tears. Um, and I've been doing it for almost 20 years. So I'd be doing a lot of kind of fusions by now. I can't remember the last time I had to do a fusion after a, a endoscopic surgery for an annular tear in a story like Tim's, which is shocking because when we tried this like 12 years ago, 15 years ago with the older instruments, it seemed like the majority of patients got better, but only for like six months and then they slowly deteriorated again. So I was waiting for that to happen and that's not happened at all. Um, but I think it's because we know a lot more now than we did 10 years ago. And we have slightly better instruments. I'm a better surgeon and probably I'm better at picking the right patients to do surgery on and knowing which patients to keep doing non-operative treatment. That's probably the most important thing. But my guess, and I don't know this for a fact, but my strong guess, my strong impression is that um, all those long-term risks related to a microdiscectomy surgery can be improved upon by doing the laser endoscopic surgery. Because I'll give you an example. Tiger Woods had a microdiscectomy. And anybody that's seen Tiger Woods take a golf swing, you know he's like a madman. I mean, my back hurts watching him swing. So he puts an incredible amount of pressure in his back muscles, all golfers do. And he's the last person that you want to detach the multifidus tendon. So uh, I always think, God, I wish you, I would have met him when he had the herniated disc and he knew about me because if we did the endoscopic surgery, I bet you would have uh, avoided a fusion. I don't know that for sure, but that's my strong inclination. So, you know, elite high level athletes that have a herniated disc and it's like, don't have a microdiscectomy unless you don't think your back muscles are, are that important for your activities because you will detach half the tendon and, and the multifidus muscle is the strongest muscle in the body, period, by like an order of magnitude. It's designed in a way that it barely moves, but the overlap of all these fibers called the actin myosin chains, for those of you that are interested in medicine, not, all, you know, the way a muscle contracts, it has these overlapping fibers that go like this. And you think all the muscles and all, and every part of the body, that overlap is optimized, but in some parts of the body, that overlap is really weak. In other parts of the body, it's stronger. And in the multifidus muscle, it is absolutely maximized, which also means it moves barely at all. So if I ask you, what does, what do you think a muscle that barely moves, but is really strong, what do you think it's designed for? And most people just immediately go, stability versus my biceps muscle. It is designed for locomotion. It's designed to bring my hand all the way up to my face. That's a locomotion muscle. That is overlapping like this. The multifidus is like this. So the last muscle you want to injure in your back is the multifidus muscle. But that is the first muscle we tend to injure during surgery. So one of the big tenets of millimeter surgery is do not injure the multifidus muscle. And this unfortunately does. This doesn't. I don't think I even answered the question. I got totally sidetracked. Um, what was the question again? Uh, I think it was after uh, after an annular tear repair in five or 10 years, is it necessitate a fusion? All right, so not only does this cause more injury to the disc, but it, it detaches the tendon of a very important muscle on one half of the back. And if you don't have that dynamic stabilizer and at the same time, you just go crazy on your back, guess what's gonna happen? That disc is just gonna get ground down and you're gonna need a fusion. And that's what Tiger Woods had. So that is a really important question that somebody brought up. I think that was, that was Dr. Hagigi. Um, because you just wanna have one surgery and never look back. So even when I do a microdiscectomy, I try to make the tiniest little incision, try to make the tiniest little um, bony window. And I just do a fragmentectomy. I remove the fragment and I gingerly reach into the disc and just remove dis loose fragments. But when I was in training, I had a group of attendees that would take a curette, go in there and just scratch the inside of it and loosen up anything that had the potential to squirt out and evacuate the disc and go, 
the likelihood of a recurrent discrimination, in other words, another discrimination in the next six months is like zero, but they didn't really think long-term, like what about the disc itself in five to 10 years? That's what uh, one of our attendees brought up and that's really important. Another good reason to try to do surgery with as little collateral damage as possible. All right, guys, it's 5.03. I'm really hoping that we answered lots of your questions. If you have more, um, send us an email and we'll try to respond to you. And you can even, are you guys up for like answering questions from patients like, what's Dr. Kim really like? What was recovery really like? Is that yes, okay? Absolutely. Is that okay, Dr. Smith? Yeah, can I type can in, I use can Dr. I type Smith in my email? Get, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Because <laughs> we can put it in the chat feature and you know, all the people that registered, uh, we're going to send them a link to the video, and then if it's okay, uh, Tim's email, Damon, you want to hold off on that? Yeah. yeah hold um, off on that, Damon. And, right. Yeah, sorry. It's, and uh, then you can send it to me. Yeah, see, okay. doctors are, like, afraid of patients having their email addresses because it's a scary thing. Yeah. Um, if you saw my email, you'll know why. You don't even want to look at my email. Um, so uh, um, we'll start with Tim and me, and then um, I'll bug Dr. Smith if anything is really relevant to him. But I can just tell you, he would have told you what happened. Um, and let's face it, he was in Yosemite while everyone was here suffering by <laughs> ourselves alone in the dark. Right. So um, thank you all for joining. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Damon, for taking out an hour of your precious time because um, I think this is really helpful for, uh, for me and for uh, all the patients that are kind of suffering with back pain. So uh, thank you again. Have a great rest of the day and stay safe and healthy. Um, and I'll see you guys at the next webinar. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.